Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really delighted to be here in lovely Singapore at this conference, uh, which is full of exciting presentations and great posters as well. Um, so today I'm going to talk about deep fakes on the web, um, the wicked challenges of ethics, law and technology. So I'm going to speak for about, as this is an hour long session, I'm going to speak to probably 45 minutes. We'll have some questions and then there's a little blurb about next year at the end before we have morning tea, okay? Um, so off I go and please do to ask questions at the end. So this year, as you've been aware already, has been a very big year for artificial intelligence. Um, the landscape of AI and AI ethics has changed with the release of ChatGPT, which was released last year, but has just got better and better. Um, and now ChatGPT was preceded by the development of large language models, foundation models, but what ChatGPT has done and its equivalence is make that technology available to anyone who has a laptop or an iPhone. Um, you don't need to be a computer programmer now to access large language models and the things that it can do or any other foundation model. Um, and ChatGPT is of course text, but We've also seen similarly astounding developments in um, the availability of, of applications using foundation models for coding um, and Im image generation and creation. And that means it's also been a big year for the web. So all of a sudden synthetic content, deep fakes, are everywhere you look. Um, these two images are, of course, deep fake images. Um, the one on one side is um, an image of Katy Perry at the Met Gala Ball just a couple of weeks ago in a fabulous dress, except she wasn't there. That's a deep fake. The other image is, um, came out of, is an image of Tom Cruise, which came out of after Mission Impossible. That's Tom Cruise with his stunt doubles, but of course it isn't. It's a deep fake. And in fact, um, probably the most commonly found deepfake images on the internet are images of K-pop stars um, doing various things, which I'll come to later. So what I'm going to talk about in this talk is I'm going to talk about the rise of deepfakes. I'm going to talk deepfakes on the web. I'm going to talk about why we are concerned about deepfakes. I think you probably all know that, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, I'm going to talk about why deepfakes are such a wicked problem. That is, they're a problem that just is really hard to resolve because it pulls us in different directions. I'm going to talk about some of the responses to deepfakes in law and technological responses as well. I'm going to talk about the ethics of deepfakes and then we'll have some questions all in the next 40 minutes now. So, deepfakes. Deepfakes are digital content, video, sound, uh, images, video, sound um, of a real person that have been edited, this is an old definition, edited or generated to create a realistic or but false depiction of them doing or saying something they never would have done. And the actual word deepfake comes from, the, from deep, deep learning, a branch of machine learning, which you will be aware of, um, to create synthetic media from existing images, audio or visual files, and fake, indicating that the media produced is inauthentic. So it's deep fakes. Now deep fakes are getting better and better and easier and easier to create. So some of you may have seen and remember this image of Barack Obama, which came out about two years ago, I think it was about two years ago, and Barack Obama says, a whole lot of things, he calls Trump some names, and then he signs off saying, thank you and stay woke, bitches. That wasn't Barack or Obama. It was a deep fake. And it was a deep fake with a really realistic voice impersonating Barack or Obama, but it was a real person who provided the voice. And the deep fake bit was just to take an image of Barack or Obama and add in a mouth that moved and was synced to the words that were being spoken. So earlier forms of deep fake images just manipulated, not just just, manipulated existing images um, and effectively substituted in faces. So it put a face of a celebrity on another image, often that was a way, um, often in fact pornographic images, or put a mouth on an existing image to have a, a, a celebrity or a um, famous person say something they never would have said. And the use of the technology was to smooth the rough spots around the images, if you like, to, to fill in the gaps and make it believable. 
But increasingly, deepfake deepfakes are created using generative AI, which creates new content. More and more text to image generators are available. Um, so these are recent options from Microsoft and Adobe. And there's also text to video and more. So this is Sora, which Google hasn't released yet, but it's about to release, which produces um, text to image in the form of reels of content. So it's not even short form video, it's actually can produce something that resembles a short movie. Um, extremely realistic and using the, the technology that is, that is, that's behind generative AI as opposed to using um, generative, uh, adversarial networks which is used in the previous um, iterations of this technology. So why should we worry about deep fakes? Deepfakes are actually quite fun. I've already shown you the fun images of Katy Perry and Tom Cruise. And if you hang out online, you'll see lots of memes being created of people singing songs, people who never would have, could or would have seen their songs, people sitting with um, uh, cartoon characters or movie actresses doing fun things. So in one sense, it's a fun technology. It's also a technology that can be used usefully in movies. So for those of you who've seen Star Wars, The Rise of, of Skywalker, you'll remember that um, Princess Leia appeared um, in that movie, notwithstanding the actress who played her had passed away, Carrie Fisher, and the appearance of Leia in that movie is a combination of pre-existing footage and deep fake technology which allowed her to be part of the movie. So the technology actually, part of the technology developed through use in movies to create special effects and it's still used to great effect in movies. Um, so any problems? Well, of course, you know the answer. There are issues. The issues are in terms of economic threats and democratic threats. Um, this is an image um, of the Pentagon. Well, this is a newspaper report recording that there was a fake image briefly briefly released last year of the Pentagon exploding and exploding at the Pentagon. And it was a fake image and it was pretty easily identified as a fake image, but it actually caused a fall in the stock market because the stock market saw the image or, and, and thought that America was under attack. So it caused a reaction, even though it was a, a deep fake, a poor deep fake, an easily identified deep fake. So the implication, the ripple effects of this technology is significant. Um, many of you will have seen or be aware of on, the, on, the, on Facebook and other social media platforms, just the prevalence of deep fake scams. And these scams are usually promoting cryptocurrency investment schemes, and they involve the face of a celebrity who seems to be very realistically promoting the in promoting investment in a particular cryptocurrency fund which they say got them rich. So here it's Elon Musk, but it's other celebrities as well. I'm from Australia. So we had the members of our Matildas, our soccer team, appearing to be on daytime TV promoting the cryptocurrency that got them rich. And you can see variations of this in almost any country. And unfortunately, people invest in these scams and they very quickly lose their money. Their money's almost untraceable. <clears throat> Except perhaps if you live in Singapore, because Singapore has really good real-time tracing of, of funds that have been um, paid pursuant to scams. Singapore's very effective at stopping um, scam payments, but in most places it's very difficult. And of course, most people who are scammed don't realise to months later, in which case the money's already gone. Um, <clears throat> the other scam going around is the mum I've lost my phone scam. This is where um, it used to occur as a text message where children apparently texted their mothers, that's me, saying, oh, I've lost my phone, can you send me money so I can get a new SIM card, which of course was a scam. The scary thing is that um, deep fake technology that allows, that allows the creation of synthetic audio is now being used to perpetuate that scam. Now, I'm a lawyer, not a technologist, but I work in a faculty of engineering and information technology, and my colleagues created a very realistic uh, voice replica of one of them from about 15 seconds of audio, just what they had with what they had available in their lab. So the deep fake phone scam has moved from text to audio, which makes it far more convincing um, to most people, actually. 
And the voice is, you know, the voice is a little bit artificial. It doesn't quite have the cadences of a real voice. It doesn't speak with an Australian accent. It has a slightly American accent, at least the technology we have where I work. But it kind of doesn't matter because you only need a short snippet of text to convince people that it's a real person who's talking, particularly if it's a person you love, where probably you're not listening to the voice so much as the urgency. And certainly it's worked on some people. So many of you will have also seen this newspaper report that came out earlier this year, where a worker in Hong Kong purportedly paid out $25 million to a scammer or a fraudster following a deep fake video call with the chief chief financial officer and apparently or purportedly in that video call there was a group of them in a zoom meeting or equivalent um, and the chief financial officer appeared to be there didn't say much didn't move much but appeared to be there and directed this payment which the junior worker followed again that was a deep fake combining video and audio and somehow getting access to that zoom call now this one is a little bit odd because I think most businesses don't pay out $25 million just like that. I think they normally do a couple of checks about where the money's going. But the point's well made. Um, deep fake romance scams have also arised. So that's where a lonely or vulnerable person is romanced by a fraudster who eventually, after establishing a romantic relationship, asks the victim to send them money. Increasingly, these are taking place through deep fake images which improve the appearance of the, the fraudster love interest. Instead of dealing with um, somebody perhaps you might not date, you are dealing with someone who resembles your fa favorite, I don't know, K-pop idol. And again, cash is sent. And I would add again, Singapore has really good methods of tracing the origins of these romance scams and, and blocking them, but that's another talk. Probably going fr from the amusing to the very dark, um, deep fake image abuse. So, sorry, some of my images have dropped out, but you all may remember that at the beginning of the year there was a scandal about deep fake images of Taylor Swift um, in sexually compromising scenarios were circulating on Twitter. Now, they were deep fake images. They were generated, Im generated using a popular text to video app. They were quickly pulled down, but not before they'd shared something like 600,000 times. And in fact, the most common use of deep fake technology has been not scams, not, not the disruption of democracy, but synthetic porn used to humiliate and embarrass people. And I mentioned earlier that K-pop stars are, are very prevalent in the deep fake imagery that you find on the internet. And unfortunately, K-pop stars are commonly shown in sexually explicit deep fake videos. So this is the unpleasant side of the technology. And let's be clear that making a deep fake image of someone doing a sexual act that they did not consent to is image abuse. There's nothing, there's nothing um, pleasant or revealing or justifiable about that. In my country, Australia, the Air Safety Commissioner has reported that children are making pornographic deep fake videos of people they don't like and using those videos to humiliate and bully them. So it's a very dark place. The other concern, of course, that we all have about deep fakes is the potential for deep fakes to disrupt elections. Um, and I have actually lost my image here, but the internet is also full of images of politicians doing things they never did. So even this year, we've had images of Trump resisting arrest, which are deep fakes. We've also had audio of um, Joe Biden telling people not to vote. And that's a deep fake. Last year, we had Nancy Pelosi um, appearing to be drunk by slowing down the video. And we've had various images of Joe Biden stumbling, falling and so on that have been manipulated and taken out of context. So the potential for the misuse of deep fake technology to disrupt 
um, democratic process is significant. Now, again, the, actually the quality of the image when you're using it for political purposes may not matter that much. It may be a poor quality image, but it kind of doesn't matter because if people are inclined to believe the worst about a particular politician, whether it's Trump or Biden, they're going to believe an image that appears to support their bias. And this is part of the problem with deep fake imagery, that it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be convincing to people who are likely to be persuaded by it. But that's enough to change the outcomes of elections. If people don't roll up to vote or if they think that a particular politician is mentally incompetent, that can still affect election outcomes. And the World Economic Forum, and again, sorry, my slide's fallen out in this one. <clears throat> the World Economic Forum did a um, risk assessment of risks for 2024, and one of those is online disinformation and misinformation spread through the web. Because you only need one image which can be shared many times across um, the whole of the internet, and then the harm is already done. So to me, this is a wicked problem. And when I say wicked problem, what I mean by that is that it's a problem that's difficult to resolve. It's difficult to resolve because there's challenges in resolving it and there's also competing normative considerations. It's not, it doesn't just point one way. And the reason it doesn't just point one way is on the one hand we go, well, we don't like deep fakes, they're problematic, they embarrass people, they humiliate people, they disrupt election, elective processes. But on the other hand, there's a, we can say, well, we better be very careful about what we regulate on the internet because the whole benefit of the internet is that it's such a place that people can share opinions and share unpopular opinions. And Remove, once we start removing content online, then we very quickly can move to a place where we're censoring content online. Now, I happen to think that, that removing, prohibiting, preventing deep fake prawn doesn't interfere with free speech. I think most countries' legislatures agree with me. I think removing material that presents politicians doing things they never did is not, doesn't interfere with freedom of speech on the internet. But there's a grey area there where perhaps we might say, well, if you start taking material down just because you don't think it's true, perhaps you're going to start, start taking down unpopular opinions. So the tension between deep fakes and freedom of speech, I personally would resolve in, in favour of getting rid of deep fakes. But there is a difficulty the further you go. And we've recently had that exhibited in Australia in a different context with a question about whether we take down, not deep fake, but real content showing a terrorist activity and the extent to which we should and can in Australia block that image being seen by the rest of the world. So, tricky problem. The other aspect of this problem is this one. Deep fakes are fake images. The images that are false, and in my view, as I've said, there's no issue in removing false images, if we can, or doing something about them. But the more we have fake images on the internet, actually we start to get people questioning true images on the internet. It's called the liar's dividend, which is if the world is, if people are swamped with images that are fake, they start to disbelieve anything that they see. And disreputable people can make, um, make use of that liar's dividend. So already we've seen politicians in various parts of the world who've been caught out on video or, on, or recorded saying or doing something that's not appropriate or isn't true or isn't politically expedient. We've seen those politicians who've been caught out going, oh, it wasn't me, it was a deep fake. So not only do deep fakes challenge um, truth in the sense that they're, they're, they're fictional, they're lies, they're making up content, but they challenge truth in the sense that people stop believing anything they see. And when people stop believing anything they see or read, we are in a very dark place, a very dark place, because we, we rely for education purposes, for social interactions, for economic transactions, for democratic 
processes, we rely on people being able to access information that helps them make decisions and that to, for people to access information that helps them make decisions, they have to be confident that they can get accurate information. If they think the whole thing is a lie, then they retreat back to, I don't know, home truths, myths and fictions. But it's also too late to stop the advance of this technology. For those of you who've seen Oppenheimer, it's perhaps a poor comparison, but it's, it's a valid one. The science is already out there. We can't pretend that we can't create synthetic images. We've made them. They're here. There's no rolling it back. Technology is getting better and better. Some people say, we well, don't release it. Well, what are we going to do? Just pretend it doesn't exist? That's the Oppenheimer challenge. Now, there's a picture of Barbie and Ken. And that's because I think we were getting a bit dark. So a moment of happiness for us all. There's no content there. It's just <laughs> me amusing myself. OK, back to the good stuff. Um, so what are our responses to deep fakes? What do we do? We've accepted my argument that we've probably, that although there might be tensions in, in, in what's fake and what's true and arguments about how much we should censor content online, I think, that, I think that there's a justifiable case for responding to deep fake images online that are harmful without banning the technology altogether. So there's a number of responses. Those, they lie in the law. That's my area. Education, that's also my area. And in the technology, that's, I think, most of your areas. So let's look at those legal responses first. So there's actually a range of legal responses to deep fake that are shared for harmful uses online. Um, and they range from requirements for transparency to reveal the, con the synthetic content um, there's some consumer protection laws which pr provide a response against scams and frauds, either a proactive response or at least a compensatory response. Um, there's the possibility of criminal offences in some context. A lot of countries are developing online safety laws. Online safety laws also link back to those transparency requirements. So let's have a look at some of those responses. Start with criminal law. So in many countries, it is a criminal offence to create or share non-consensual intimate images using technology, sharing them online. Now, often, in fact, the, the person who's created a non-consensual intimate image can't be found because they just created and put it out there. That was the case with the Taylor Swift intimate image. But in a lot of countries, the offence extends to sharing the image, and that's where the law does become more effective because it says, don't, if, you, if you're sent the image, don't share it. The sharing can be problematic, and that's more likely to be um, able to be captured or prosecuted by the authorities. And there's just an example up there um, from Victoria. Um, it's also quite useful, this sort of law is quite useful in workplaces because there's actually quite a lot often in workplaces or schools I mentioned, there's bullying or abuse that takes place through manipulating images online and then sharing that amongst workers or school kids. Again, this sort of law um, provides a disincentive or deterrence against that sort of activity. Criminal law is a pretty um, hard line response to uh, using deep fake technology, even for non-consensual sharing or creation of intimate images. Um, the other response we see in many jurisdictions is an, some kind of online safety um, commissioner or regulator who has the power to request non-consensual images to be taken, intimate images to be taken down, including offensive deep fake images. And often, um, online safety laws give the commissioner or the regulator power to request platforms and websites to remove images that are harmful. So that would be intimate images that a person hasn't consented to, but also terrorist material or extremely violent material, including material created as a deep fake. And that's another quite effective response because it at least stops the images being constantly viewed and shared, although it's not 
it's not prosecuting the original creator, it's stopping the image um, moving across the internet in the, with sort of rapid speed and escalating sharings. Uh, Singapore has a, um, its uh, Infocom Media Development Authority is the p party that enforces the e-safety laws and, as I said, has powers to remove certain materials, child sex abuse, um, terrorism and so on, including synthetic material that's been generated using deep fakes. Um, transparency and disclosure requirements. Increasingly, laws are being passed, actually, to require developers, that's the people that create the, the LLMs that allow, the, the create, that allow um, deep fakes to be generated, and also deployers, that's the people that package it up in an app, to disclose um, where the image is, is, is a deep fake. Um, and so President Biden last year issued an executive order requiring um, the Department of Commerce to study ways to identify and mark synthetic content as well as um, to trace, track and verify authentic content. Um, and many of you will have heard or be subject to the EU AI Act, which imposes transparency requirements on those people who are developers or deployers of technology that can create defects to embed, develop, disclose the, con the existence of synthetic material online. And those laws are binding now, so we see the technology, well, the Biden one is a direction, the EUA Act is, is about to come into force, so we see, we're increasingly seeing developers taking steps to respond to defects by technological developments. Next response, so we talked about the law, sort of tinkers around the edges, but hopefully provides incentives for people to think and disclose before they use this material. Education, there's been a great emphasis on education, educating people about the risk of defakes and indeed scams. And that's a useful response. People do need to understand that not everything they see or hear um, is true and that, that some content that appears realistic might be artificially generated, might be um, a deep fake. And there's t things you can do to look out for a deep fake. So, for example, this is a photo of President Trump. It's an um, AI-generated image. Um, and if you look closely, the fingers are... He's missing some fingers. You probably can't see it in this image, but the, the actual fingers don't work. And what we know is that at this point in time, many deep fake images aren't perfect. They have problems with them. So people who want to look closely at them are going to be able to identify them. Remember, um, Princess Catherine um, was revealed to have manipulated the images of her with her children. It wasn't a deep fake. Well, I guess it kind of was. It had deep fake elements in it. But people picked that up by looking at inconsistencies in the images. So, you know, deep fake images can still at this point of time sometimes be um, identified. The problem is, as I said before, if we're talking about scams or misuse, the people who are susceptible to scams and misuse and, dis and the tendency to believe sen sensational outlandish views aren't going to spend a lot of time looking carefully at the image. They're going to be reacting to the emotion behind the image. So that if you're a Trump supporter, you don't care that this is a deep fake image. You're going, look at Trump, such a hero, you know, praying, praying to God that he won't be prosecuted. Yep. Yeah, and take that as a comment. Um, the other issue with the education response is a lot of the techniques that, that are used in education about how to identify deep fakes simply no longer are relevant because the technology is improving so quickly. So here's a paper from 2020 using looking at eye blinking. Um, so actually, this is a great paper. So the paper started with the proposition that early deep fake images could be identified as deep fakes because they didn't blink. That's the sort of un uncanny valley effect. They, the deep fake would stare, and that's a real giveaway that it's a deep fake, not, an, not a human. Well, guess what? The people who create deep fake images worked that out, and now deep fake images blink, which is the, what's established in this paper. So that trick for identifying deep fakes very quickly ceased to apply. 
Here's another one. Um, Stanford developed a tool for identifying deep fakes by looking at whether the mouth synced with the words that were coming out. Because remember I mentioned um, that one of the ways that deep fakes used to be created would be to take original video of a person and then basically patch a mouth onto it. That was the Barack Obama deep fake. And often the mouth didn't really move properly um, it didn't move in sync with the words or it didn't move in sync with the face. Um, so Stanford developed a tool to basically correlate, look at whether the words matched the um, movement of the mouth. But guess what? Deepfakes aren't now created by merging mouths and other images. They're actually generated from scratch. So this technique doesn't work anymore. And even the, the technology that does does merge body parts to create a seemingly realistic deepfake has got much better in response to this kind of um, tool. The other one that was used to investigate deepfakes is people used to say, look at the blood flow, look and see if the deepfake image appears to have blood, veins um, in their neck or their um, wrists, look and see if the cheeks are flushed. So looking for those really imperceptible indications of humanness. Early deep fakes, you could spot that. Later deep fakes, much harder. So educating people to look for deep fakes is kind of a bit of a loser's game because the technology is getting better. And also we don't want it, we don't want the liars dividend to win. If you tell people too much, don't believe what you see online, it might be a deep deep fake. They won't believe anything. And you might have the authorities going, move to higher ground, there's a flood, and people will go, nah, that's a deep fake, I'm staying at home. So there's issues with that. Technological responses. Because I'm a lawyer, I think the technological responses are the most exciting part of combating deepfakes. I love the technology that's being developed to, de to, to identify deepfakes. So you're going to have to humour me for a minute while I talk a little bit about this. So red teaming and guardrails. Um, those um, entities that are producing the technology that allows deepfakes to be created, the the chat GPTs, the Sauras, uh, the Dalis, and so on. So Microsoft, OpenAI, Google, Adobe, are starting to develop what they call guardrails about what, what those generative technologies can do. So they don't want, those, those developers don't want chat GPT being used to give instructions to someone about how to commit terrorist activities. And they don't want image generators being used to create images of celebrities in pornographic situations, not intimate image abuse. So they're starting to um, put guardrails, retrain those models so that they will not produce certain content. If you ask ChatGPT how to commit a terrorist activity, it should say, I can't tell you that. If you ask Dali to put a celebrity's head on a pornographic, or create a porno, an image of a celebrity undertaking pornographic activities, clearly non-consensual, it probably won't do that. It's called, and then we have this thing called red teaming where those technology companies send in hackers to try and get round the guardrails and in so doing prove the performance of the guardrails. Um, we also have deep fake detection tools that scan for inconsistencies. Those are quite good, but if you read this article, which is the five best deep fake detector tools, all of them rely on the things I was talking about earlier that we educate people about. They rely on identifying flaws in the images, eyes that don't blink, blood that doesn't pulse, and uh, mouths that don't move in sync. So increasingly the deep fake detector tools aren't going to work because the images are getting better and generative AI um, makes it harder to detect deep fakes. Um, some of the tech companies are developing their own image detection tools, but at the moment these only work with their own technology. However, the tech companies have come together They've come together, actually they've been working together for a while, if you hadn't noticed. Um, they've come together to create content, providence and authenticity trust marks. And what we have seen developed from this group, Coalition for Content, Providence and Authenticity, is a trust mark, which is the C2PA trust mark, which is a little icon that will be attached to images that are produced using their tools, or in the case of Google and the other platforms, shared 
on their platforms. And that little trust mark has metadata which indicate, which is cryptographically signed and indicates the providence of the image. So here's an example from OpenAI where images created in ChatGPT uh, have metadata explaining the providence of the image, which you can look at if you click on the little icon up the top side of the screen, and that um, metadata will tell you that it's a synthetically created image. You probably guess in this case, but in other cases you might not. Um, now that C2PA standard is designed to tackle the origin, the issue of trustworthiness of images by tracking the origin and history of online assets so people can find out the providence of an image um, via cryptographically signed metadata. And this technology only works um, if the platforms buy into it because normally when images are uploaded to a, a platform, uploaded to the web, the metadata is stripped because we want to um, preserve the privacy of the users for one thing. And what the platforms have said is, is platforms like TikTok actually and also some of the other ones are saying that they will keep that credential. They won't remove the metadata related to that credential that's been developed by the Coalition for Authenticity. They'll keep it with the image so that people looking at images online can learn, can choose to click on the um, trust mark to understand the origin of the image they're looking at. Um, and, and that's a useful, that's, that's not a foolproof technology because there's other ways to remove the metadata and the little trust mark. For example, you can take a photograph of the image and share it. The metadata won't travel with the photograph. But it's, it's something. Um, and the metadata, I've sort of talked about its use in identifying deep fakes. So um, ChatGPT will attach the trust mark with the cryptographically signed metadata to its images. But you can also use that same technology to authenticate true images to overcome that problem of the liars dividend. So FoxCorp has launched a blockchain platform that, that media companies can use to verify the images that they have created or the news stories that they have created and then that, that trust mark and the metadata behind it can be traced back to the blockchain and people who are interested can verify the authenticity of the news story or the image and also track whether it's been changed as it moves through the web. So that's dealing with that concern about how do we, not only how do we identify deep fakes, but how do we identify true images. Now, trust marks depend a little bit on platforms prepared, being prepared to recognise them. They depend on people who are viewing the image, understanding they can click on the trust mark and look at the metadata. They depend on, on clever users not being able to remove the trust mark and manipulate the metadata. A more sort of um, a stronger response, I guess, is um, to use digital watermarks. So as I've said, trust credentials are added as metadata to, uh, to an asset, to a digital um, image. They're not embedded in the image and therefore they can be reasonably easily stripped by a malicious actor using simple tools or just photographing the image and then repopulating it. Digital watermarkers create a more sticky link between the digital content and its origins. And a watermark is, it, it's like the thing you see on your banknotes, which identifies the banknotes um, as authentic, but a watermark, watermark is embedded in an image, video or track to identify that content as AI generated. So, and then that signal, that watermark, can be detected by algorithms that scan for it, um, effectively identifying the images as, as, as deep fakes. Um, watermarks are harder to remove um, they can be made compatible with platform architecture, but this is still very much a work in progress. Um, interestingly, this technology is also being used in text. They're tr um, the uh, companies like OpenAI, Microsoft are trialling putting watermarks in text as well as in images. And putting watermarks in text or other identifying features is, of course, too interesting to universities who are worried about the use of these technologies to cheat, um, for students to cheat. So not just deep fakes 
on the web, but also students using um, generative AI or ChatGPT to do assessments and watermarking may be a way of picking that up as well. But it's still in its infancy. It's really early technology. Um, it's not infallible, still being developed, still can be removed, still can be got around. Won't convince people who don't want to be convinced. I've been talking with great glee because I love te not the technology. I've been talking to you about, you know, trust marks and metadata and pixel level watermarks that have to be identified by an algorithm. Most people looking at images online aren't going to take those steps. They're just going to go, oh, well, the image appears to be real, particularly if there's a scam attached, where, as I said, they're responding to the emotion rather than the veracity of the image. So the technology isn't infallible. It's a cat and mouse game. But what I'd say to you, it's still useful. It's still useful because, remember, I mentioned that a lot of the online safety um, commissioners have takedown powers. They can ask false images to be taken down. A lot of the platforms are interested in keeping uh, disinformation off the platform, particularly with elections coming up. Can't, can't intrude on freedom of speech, but, you know, you can remove um, deep fakes, which are synthetically generated because, by definition, they're fakes, and fakes don't threaten our true belief in free speech. Um, and the use of watermarking and credentials gives, gives those gatekeeping platforms, the gatekeepers to the internet, a way of identifying fake content and removing it. So even if the average punter won't, or the average person won't look at the technology, it provides a way for, for either regulators or platforms to respond to fake synthetic material and remove it where it could be harmful. So it's worth continuing to investigate, and indeed, under the EU AI Act and President Biden's executive order, efforts to in digital watermarking are required by law. So where do ethics come in? What's the ethics of deepfakes? So here are the OECD principles of ethical AI. They relate to inclusive sustainability, human-centred values, fairness, transparency, robustness and accountability. They're important principles that inform the develop that should inform the development of AI technology. And in fact, a lot of these principles are what has now been embedded in law in the EAI, the EU AI Act. But how do they apply to deep fakes? They're not immediately apparent because who creates deep fakes that are harmful? Not us, right? Not us who are sitting here who are interested in the ethical development and use of technology. Really harmful deepfakes are done by bad actors who don't care about these ethical principles. By definition, they want to disrupt democracy or humiliate their work co-workers or celebrities. Or they want to perpetuate cryptocurrency scams or romance scams. So they're not that worried about these ethical principles. So do these ethical principles remain relevant in the context of deepfakes? Well, I think they do, and I think they do for this reason. Those ethical principles emphasise that when we're dealing with AI, when we're dealing with technology, we should be focused on humans. We should be focused on fairness. We should be focused on inclusivity. And we're all responsible for those values. All of us that are dealing online with AI, with technology, are responsible for those values. And certainly, we may not be the people who are using technology to bully, humiliate, cheat. But we also have the capacity to step up and respond to that misuse of the technology. All of us that understand the problem and understand the technology have the capacity to play a part in responding to the issue of deep fakes. And this may be by providing training and education. It may be by developing the technology that allows deep fakes to be um, identified and removed. And it may be by simply talking to people about the importance of truth and providing an understanding of the threat to truth that's posed by deep fake technology without them throwing out the idea of truth altogether because then we're totally lost. That's the, that is the Oppenheimer moment. There isn't one response to the problem of technology. 
of deep fake technology. There's no one response to deep fakes. There's many responses. None of those responses individually are effective, but together they can, they can work kind of as a jigsaw. A jigsaw is responses that reduce the impact of deep fake technology on humans and on society. And for that, we need a coalition of truth. And for those of us who are interested in AI or the internet or technology or truth, we need to be part of that coalition. And that's all from me.